Modernism was awful. Its denial of any possibility of miracles and the invisible God was the worst. There were so many negative impacts on the way people viewed the scriptures and the gospel as a result of the age of modernism. Well, the only thing worse than modernism is postmodernism. For every benefit from postmodernism for how people view the workings of the gospel and the Bible, there are about a dozen negatives. Postmodernism isn't all bad, but there's not a whole lot of good about it at the same time. As an example, I recently saw the following on Twitter that I feel like really illustrates the current assault on the gospel from the postmodernist viewpoint. I was feeling sad today, so I asked ChatGPT to write a fake biblical passage about Jesus accepting trans people. Here's what it came up with. And a woman, whose heart was divided between spirit and body, came before him. In quiet despair, she asked, Lord, I come to you, estranged, for my spirit and body are not one. How shall I hope to enter the kingdom of God? Jesus looked upon her with kindness, replying, My child, blessed are those who strive for unity within themselves, for they shall know the deepest truths of my Father's creation. Be not afraid, for in the kingdom of God there is no man nor woman, as all are one in spirit. The gates of my Father's kingdom will open for those who love and are loved. For God looks not upon the body, but the heart. That, to me, is the best example I've seen of the postmodern gospel. It's a gospel that is tweaked and catered to whatever will help me love me and then aligns with whatever is the latest thing, which right now the latest thing is the explosion of the queer movement. Well, way back in 2013, J.B. Hickson saw the dangers of postmodernism and the threat that they presented the gospel. So he responded by writing a book, Getting the Gospel Wrong, the evangelical crisis no one is talking about. Well, 10 years later, further into postmodernism, and let me tell you, JB got it right. So let me tell you what he got right, why I think this book needs an update, and why you should allow Hickson to help you get the gospel right. Welcome to Rev Reads. If you want to discover more books that will help you stay grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, please subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with my most current reviews. Also, please like and share this video with others to help them know about the work of J.B. Hickson. So let's start off with the biggest problem for getting the gospel wrong. And it's a problem not because it's Hickson's fault, and if anything comes from this review, I would like it to be a third updated edition for this book. So let's start off with the problem first. In 2013, I think the world was more in a place where we lived at the same time in two worlds. One, the world of modernism, and two, the world of postmodernism. The world's response to COVID then led the world into just this hyper move into postmodernism. So what JB does in this book is talk about six ways people were getting the gospel wrong. And with those six ways is that this book was intended to be written on postmodernism's assault to the gospel. And for someone who's read a truckload of works on the current postmodern landscape, his first four chapters in this book, they are a brilliant call to remain faithful to the gospel in this postmodern world. But then he selects six examples that were current ways that people were getting the gospel wrong in 2013. The problem, though, is that the culture has shifted away from that mix of modernism and postmodernism in 2013 to a headfirst dive into a shallow pool of postmodernism in 2023. And therefore, his six examples of getting the gospel wrong, they need to be updated for today. The purpose gospel, the prosperity gospel, and the performance gospel, those were all problems that were more rooted in modernism than postmodernism. And while an update would need to keep the prosperity gospel and simply shift the examples to cover the new apostolic reformation of Bethel Church, the purpose and performance gospel should be dropped and replaced 
by the woke gospel, as seen through its views of power and sex, and so it kind of needs two chapters to cover. You see, there wasn't anything wrong with what Hickson put out in 2013, but today there are new assaults to the gospel that fit more directly under the umbrella of postmodernism. I think you could even keep the purpose and performance gospels as appendices in the back of the book as examples of dangers from modernism. So there's the problem with this book. This book needs an update to confront issues that just weren't here 10 years ago, but are now the most common assaults on the gospel today. And I gotta say, the first four chapters of this book, though, where Hickson sets the stage on what the gospel is, those chapters were excellent. His chapters on establishing the gospel and saving faith, his coverage especially on the nature of saving faith was so good. Part of the reason I would love to see this book updated today is that I want to see even more people to have their eyeballs reading what Hickson wrote on the gospel. He does a great job of boiling the gospel of Jesus Christ down to five easy-to-grasp points that, in my opinion, are not overbearing or legalistic. He keeps the main thing the main thing. And personally, I'm just baffled that someone would read his chapter on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who died and rose from the dead to pay our penalty from sin and then gives eternal life to all who trust in him alone for it. I'm shocked anyone could object to that in any way. It's five points, one sentence, simple, clear. A child could grasp this. And also for someone who is very passionate about what faith is and the importance of faith as being the object of who we are trusting in and not the quality of our faith, that chapter on faith was so good. Uh, to me, chapter four in this book might have been the singular best chapter I've read from any book this year. So all of that setting the stage was just excellent. And then his coverage on how people get the gospel wrong, it's good, the biggest problem, again, is just how different people are presenting the gospel today in comparison to only 10 short years ago. At times in those sections, he does seem a little bit nitpicky in pointing out places where people stumbled in their presentations of the gospel. But if you remember that the point of this book is to be clear in the gospel, so if there's a place where you should get a little nitpicky on places where people could be more clear or more consistent, this book would be it. And I think it's important to read through this and think, how am I falling into these traps? Am I giving the gospel to one person in a way that would be completely different message to someone else? Am I ignoring the eternal aspects of the gospel in order to appease others? Have I turned the gospel from the grace of a gift to be received by faith through Christ into a mountain of works that someone needs to climb by putting off enough sins? Or have I watered down the gospel so much that all of a sudden it just turns into, Jesus wants you to love you for you? It could really be soul-searching to read through these problems and think about how you present the gospel. Which then leads me to the last of the ways that Hickson says the gospel is being wrong. Which is where things are going to get a little personal for me and maybe some others who are watching. Uh, but if you're watching this review and you don't care about Sean Wilson's current views on the Grace Evangelical Society and the Crossless Gospel, you can probably stop watching here. But if you're curious about knowing that, things are maybe going to get a little personal. The last way that the gospel is wrong in this book is the Crossless Gospel. The Crossless Gospel is the gospel presented by the Grace Evangelical Society, which is the belief that the gospel can be boiled down to believing in Jesus for eternal life that will never be lost. Now, thanks to what Hickson wrote in this book, I went back and read Hodges and Wilkin in the GES Journal and Grace and Focus magazine, and I gotta say, I was pretty saddened about what I read and felt like I've gotten some things wrong about GES over the last couple of years. During my short time going to GES conferences, reading their books, even speaking at one of their conferences, and writing a couple articles in Grace and Focus, I was under the impression that the divide in free grace circles was more of a splitting of theological hairs and misrepresentation than anything based on substance. 
For my view, it was all based on what I thought was a speech, but then turned out to be an article on a desert island scenario, where Hodges presents a scenario of a man on a deserted island who had never heard the gospel before, but while he is on the go- that island, he reads John 6, 43 to 47, reads those verses and believes in the gospel. So can someone be saved based upon the message that is alone con- con- put together in John 6, 43 to 47? And I've always thought, sure, under those bizarre circumstances, God would save someone who's on a deserted island who read John 6, 43 to 47, and had never heard of the gospel anywhere else. And I also thought to separate, though, over this weird desert island scenario was foolish. And what also got me to sympathize with GES was one point in their view on the gospel. And that is, I do believe that the place where the saving work of Jesus happens is when we entrust our souls to Jesus. When we believe that Jesus gives us his eternal life, that's the moment the saving work happens. It's when we're like, Jesus, I need you to save me with your work and what you've done. But believing that that's where the saving work happens does not then mean that the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection thereby become unnecessary when sharing the gospel and what a person believes for salvation. Now, after reading Hickson's book, which then led me to read the Zane Hodges GES articles for myself for the first time, and some of Bob Wilkins from that time as well, I read Zane's books before, but now I'm reading these articles, I saw it was much more than a desert island scenario. Hodges was really arguing that it was flawed to see a necessity in presenting Jesus as the crucified and risen Savior. He's saying it's optional. You don't need to talk about the cross in the empty tomb. But I would say it's not. You need to believe in Jesus for who Jesus is as presented in Scripture. And in my opinion, the fundamental truths you need to believe about Jesus is that he is the crucified and risen Savior. And in my opinion, you aren't trusting in the Jesus of the Bible to save you if you don't know these fundamental truths about Jesus. We need something to differentiate the Savior from all the other men who are named Jesus. So if you share the gospel and you leave out the cross and the resurrection, I think you are committing a crime against the gospel and withholding the most beautiful truth about Jesus, truth that you hold dear from the person with whom you are sharing the gospel. And the interesting thing is that when we look at the traits of postmodernism, Grace Evangelical Society, and the way they've whittled the gospel down to such a small point, it's kind of right in line with postmodernism. In fact, out of Hicks's six examples of ways people are getting the gospel wrong based on postmodernism, I would say the most postmodern of all the views is the pluralistic view, and second would probably be the GES view. And the crazy thing about JB's book is how succinct and short his presentation of the gospel is. And reading through that chapter, I ended up thinking, man, if we can't get behind these five simple points, how can we really have unity over anything? To me, unity in the free grace movement is very important right now. I want to be to shoulder to shoulder with so many wonderful servants of Christ, godly men who are proclaiming the gospel. In fact, after reading some of Wilkin and Hodges' writing from this time period of the controversy, it ended up being that the only place I really disagreed with Hickson's take on GES was when he wrote, Scholars, pastors, teachers, and laymen alike must boldly speak out, noting those who are promoting the crossless gospel, as it has been called, and shunning them. I take note of that one place because I feel like by leaving out the cross, And referring to those who insist on bringing up the resurrection, calling them theological legalists, it's the GES camp who has shunned everyone else. And I think we, in turn, need to keep repeating a refrain that if you enjoy the joy and the hope of the cross, if you share in in the hope of the resurrection, don't deny its necessity to be shared with others. Don't stop others from hearing what you have taken comfort in for the gospel yourself. I mean, here I am, 
I, I'm Sean Wilson, still consider myself a junior very much in the free grace movement. But I'm standing here as the pastor of Grace Community Bible Church, teacher of the word of God, a proclaimer of the gospel, a book reviewer, and I have hundreds of flaws and foibles. I have so many mistakes. And if somebody criticizes this review in particular, I'll probably just agree with your criticism because without Christ, I feel like I'm just a total failure. But here I am. And the reason I'm here, though, is because I am standing in Jesus Christ through faith. I am here in the strength of his grace. I am only in this grace because God sent his only son, Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He covered my sins, and he gave me his eternal life. And I welcome all who will stand with me in this place on that clear gospel presentation. But to me, if you, if you want to deny any of that, whether it's the cross, the resurrection, deny it by saying it's optional or not important. I'm going to say, not that I am shunning or walking away from me, you, but you have walked away from the gospel. I love the people in the Grace Evangelical Society and in their circles. I, I found them to be wonderfully welcome, welcoming, Christ-like, humble. I so thoroughly enjoyed my time with all of them. And I really just want them to stand for the cross, stand for the resurrection. I want them to step out and say, when I share the gospel, I'm going to share with people that Jesus died for their sins. I'm going to share with every person that Jesus rose from the dead to give them eternal life. I'm going to talk about how our sin separated us from God and how Jesus wants to bring us that eternal life. I want to stand with those who will stand with the gospel. And if you'll stand with the gospel, I'll stand with you. And I hope that my wrestling through this will not bring further disunity, but it'll bring further unity. And I really think that one of the things that surprised me about JB's book is that because of some things that I'd heard and some assumptions that I had, I thought this book would be divisive. But instead, I believe that JB presents a view of the gospel that is so simple and clear and easy to get behind that what I want to get behind is saying, Sean doesn't need to reinvent the wheel on how to view the gospel for us to get together. JB already did it, and it's really simple. And we just need to come together and proclaim the wonder of what Christ has done for us. There are not enough of us out there in the free grace movement. And we need to not only spread the joy of the gospel more and get the world and those who don't know Christ to come and believe, but we also need to unite as brothers and sisters in Christ because God takes joy over our unity and the place we should find our unity is in the simple childlike faith gospel and what Jesus has done for us.